Good evening, and welcome to the second installment of this year's Madison Vision Series. And I want to give a special thanks to our veterans on this Veterans Day. Uh, we really appreciate your service to our country. Since 2013, the Madison Vision Series has brought together prominent thinkers from a wide variety of backgrounds to discuss the important issues of our times. These presentations help us to reflect on what it means to be engaged and enlightened citizens in a democratic society. Today's topic, of course, could not be timelier. Just one week after a historic election that demonstrated how divided our nation appears to be, we welcome two JMU alums who have a reputation for finding commonalities in their service to the Commonwealth. First, I'll introduce Delegate Kirk Cox from the class of 1979. Kirk had a long career teaching government at Manchester High School in Chesterfield County. He was first elected to the House of Delegates in 1989. Kirk represents the 66th district, which encompasses the city of Colonial Heights and parts of Chesterfield County. He has served in a number of leadership positions in Richmond, most recently, as many of you know, as Speaker of the House from 2018 to 2020. And prior to becoming Speaker, Cox served as Majority Leader and Majority Whip. And incidentally, Kirk is also the 2019 College of Arts and Letters Distinguished Alumni winner. So welcome, Kirk. We're so glad to have you with us. And Senator Scott Suravel from the class of 1993 uh, Scott is a trial lawyer and was the co-founding partner and owner of the law firm Servell Isaacs and Levi PLC. He has a long career in public service at the state and local levels. Scott was elected to the Virginia Senate back in 2015, representing the 36th district, which includes Fairfax, Prince William, and Stafford counties in the towns of Occoquan, Dumfries, and Quantico. From 2009 to 2015, he served as the state delegate for the 44th district. And of course, another award winner uh, in our midst, Scott is the winner of multiple state level awards for leadership, most recently being recognized with the Virginia Equal Rights Coalition's Equal Rights Champion Award. The fact that these two alums have represented JMU so well in public service demonstrates the longstanding connection between JMU and civic engagement. And indeed, the commitment Scott and Kirk have shown to the Commonwealth demonstrates that a commitment to the public good is in our DNA here at JMU. I especially want to thank Delegate Cox and Senator Suravel for their support for higher education. They understand the value and the importance of higher education to the economic and civic health of the Commonwealth. And the recent budget support for higher education is just one example we are grateful to both of you for your service and for your support. Now, leading tonight's discussion are two fellow Dukes, Caitlin Reed and Ashley Harris. Caitlin is the Director of State Government Relations at JMU. She's a double Duke and has served the university in several roles, most recently as the university spokesperson. And Ashley, a senior, is president of the JMU debate team and an honors college student with a double major in history and psychology. So the structure for tonight's event, uh, we will have brief opening statements from each of our speakers, then followed by a guided Q&A session with our moderators. We'll then open it up to the floor uh, to our audience who may ask questions by typing them into the chat on the live stream. And at the very end, I'll come back with some brief closing remarks. So without further ado, I'd like to now turn it over to Delegate Cox to kick off tonight's program, followed by Senator Surabell. Enjoy the program, everybody. Well, thank you so much, President Alger, uh, for the nice introduction. I also want to say thank you to all the veterans on Veterans Day for your great uh, work. And it's great to be here with Scott. Scott's much younger, uh, better looking than me, 1993. Uh, if you go back to Kirk Cox's Madison career, there was no East Campus. There was only D Hall, or what we call Gibbons Hall. So uh, obviously JM, JMU looks much different because when I started, it was Madison College. So it's great to be part of Madison's vision series. Our topic tonight, particularly, I think is going to be civility, uh, bipartisanship, and sort of how we can get uh, the dialogue going and 
in a robust republic. So I'm excited about those topics. Uh, as President Alger said, I'm a 30-year public school teacher. Uh, one of the things I'm proud of is being the first speaker to actually be a public school teacher. And in my intro remarks, it's interesting. When I got in General Assembly way back in 1990, there were 39 Republicans. Uh, around 2000, we took the majority. We got up to 67 Republicans, and now we're down to 45. So I've been in both the majority and the minority, and both the majority and minority have crucial roles in a Democratic Republic. Uh, the minority has a key role, and that is to be the loyal opposition, to hold the majority accountable, to ask those key questions. And obviously, we're in the majority. You're in a better position to drive policy, et cetera. But the really important thing is for each side to listen to each other. And if you really look over the years, probably 70% to 80% of the issues really don't involve Republican and Democrat. I think there's a myth out there that every issue is a hand-to-hand -hand combat between either a conservative, a liberal, or Democrat Republican view. And look, we have some issues that are that, and they're important. And you need to have core values, and you need to be able to argue those. But it, I'll give you a quick example. When I first got to the General Assembly, there was a big fight over the Lake Gaston pipeline. So if any of you have ever been to Lake Gaston, it's this nice little resort on the North Carolina border, a rural area. And basically, Virginia Beach wanted their water. It was a very contentious issue, I can remember. And the way it lined up, it had nothing to do with Republican and Democrat, is where you were from, from geographically. Were you from an urban area that was growing like Virginia Beach that desperately needed water? Or were you from a rural area that was one of your few resources? And it ended up where, frankly, geographically is how people sided with each other. And so we have a lot of issues like that. We have cer certain issues like veterans and President Alger said higher ed where uh, you don't really see a whole lot of partisan difference. We really try to work on veterans issues with things like Wounded Warrior and Virginia Values Veterans getting veterans jobs. And there are tons of issues like that. One that I know Scott might mention he worked on very, very hard was an environmental issue dealing with coal ash, a very toxic ash that, of course, really affected Virginia. And we had a great bipartisan um, solution to that, which greatly improves our environment. So the challenge is this, I think, and that is in a part-time citizen legislature like Virginia, you need to have strong views. You better have some core principles, but you have to have respect for the other side, respect for their ideas. You need to listen to what both sides have to say. Both sides have good input. When you have bills, you need to make sure they are well-written, they're technically good, and experts on both sides can help that. And I will finish with this. What I love about our system is I'm a teacher. Uh, you have doctors. You, we had a tree surgeon at one time, which I thought was a very interesting profession. We come from all different walks of life. The reason why our system works well is we go back to that walk of life. And so we experience what's going on the latest techniques, whether it be teaching or healthcare, agriculture, et cetera. We tend to listen to each other more. Um, and that's important. We've got to be careful not to become too much like Washington. So that is what we need to strive for with the oldest legislative body in the uh, new world where where representative democracy started. So my, my heart is in that, uh, is in public service and trying to serve the citizens. So, it's great to be with y'all. I really look forward to uh, answering the questions with Scott and having a great dialogue. So thank y'all for having me today. And thanks, Kirk. And, and, and likewise, I want to thank our veterans out there who, uh, you know, we wouldn't live under the freedom that we do today without their sacrifice of them and, and their families that uh, that allow them to, to serve our country. And uh, and the sacrifice, I guess, represented by all those flags there behind Caitlin there on the, on the quad today. Um, and uh, it's I really I'm really excited to be back at JMU at least virtually. Um, I have a daughter there who's a, a freshman who just just started, and uh, I got to come back to campus and move her in twice now <laughs> uh, because of the uh, what's going on with the pandemic. But uh, you know I, I miss JMU. Those were some of my um, favorite times in my life. And uh, I know right now I think a lot of people feel like there's a lot of political chaos in our country. And I was thinking back about what 
was going on in the national scene at the time I, I was at JMU. And I started in the fall of 1989. And in the fall of 18, 1989, Virginia elected the first black governor in the history of the United States of America. And nobody thought it was going to happen. All the polls said he was going to lose. <laughs> and Doug Wilder won in November. And uh, shortly after that, we went into a horrible recession. The economy went, went right into the ditch. Tax revenues went down. They put a hiring freeze, tuition freeze at JMU. And, uh, and that got me paying attention to state politics. But at the same time, nationally, the wall came down in Eastern Europe. The Soviet Union broke up my sophomore year. <laughs> All these new countries came into existence, which hadn't existed before. We invaded Iraq. My, uh, I guess we invaded Iraq. I think it was the uh, beginning of my sophomore year. We invaded Somalia my junior year. Uh, the um, uh, Bill Clinton got elected. We had a one-term, our first one-term president. Uh, well, since uh, I guess uh, Jimmy Carter, when Bill Clinton took out George Bush in the uh, beginning of my senior year. Uh, and, you know, there was a lot going on internationally in the world. It felt like there was a lot of chaos. The whole world was changing. You know, myself, Kirk, you know, we grew up with the whole idea of the Soviet Union was this enemy and they had all their missiles pointed at us. And we had these, you know, lockdown drills and things and all that just completely radically changed in a matter of pretty much months. And there was a lot of change going on. And politically, at JMU, there was a lot of conflict as well. And there was a lot of people that were seeing the political changes going on within the, within the country, the world, and in our state. And uh, it generated a lot of dialogue at school, in student government. The um, uh, whole Rodney King situation happened. You guys probably don't know what that is, but that, that happened in the middle of my sophomore, junior year. So, uh, you know, a lot of these things have been going on for a while, and, um, and a lot of conflict's been going on. And I couldn't agree more with Kirk that it's important, I think, that people continue to talk and have dialogue, that you seek out opinions that are different from your own information sources, that you don't just read stuff that, you, that, that repeats the things you want to hear. Uh, I think that's a big part of what we need to do to have a more informed political dialogue. And um, in terms of uh, what Kirk mentioned about Richmond, you know, likewise, uh, you know, the, the one I remember is uranium mining. We had a big fight about uranium mining. And and that didn't really become a partisan thing. The, 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 the legislators who represented Pennsylvania County didn't want uranium mining. And there were Democrats that were for it. There were Democrats against it, Republicans for it, Republicans against it. It wasn't really a partisan issue. And you know, unfortunately, the press likes to cover the conflict. Conflict makes for much more interesting uh, newspaper stories and blog articles and social media and TV than, than us getting along all the time. And so uh, that, that tends to be what people see a lot. But at least my experience in Richmond has been that it's uh, for the most part, a pretty collaborative place and uh, a place where we all um, tend to tend to uh, get along, become close friends and try to do the best we can when we can work together to find common ground and get things done. So um, I'm hopeful that uh, we can uh, have a good dialogue to uh, help, uh, help you all do the same thing in, in your own personal lives. Great. Well, thank you both so much for those opening remarks. Um, Ashley, it's great to be here with you as well as my co-moderator. Do you want to go ahead and start with, with our first question of the evening? Yes, thank you. So both of you are JMU alums and you've been incredible advocates for education at the state level. Can you talk a bit about the ways Virginia and higher education have changed since you were students at JMU? Additionally, could you discuss the ways that you've advocated for higher education in ways that might be noticeable to college students today? Kirk, you want sure, to go first? I, you go first. You got Scott, me. you go first. Why don't we alternate? Since I went first last time, you go first, then we'll alternate every time. So got fire it. away. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, first of all, Virginia is just a completely different place than when I was at JMU uh, in 89 to 93. I, I was just, for curiosity's sake, I went back and looked at the census data about an hour ago just to make sure I wasn't misremembering things. But when I started at Madison in 1989, Virginia, I think, was 78% white, 19% African-American, and 3% other. <laughs> and this state is a whole different state today. And, uh, and so is campus. I'm sure campus is a whole different place than, than it was when I was there. Um, Virginia didn't really have a, a foreign-born population like it does today. The area I represent 
one in four people that I represent was born in another country out of the 220,000 people that I represent. And so, you know, you see that a lot in Virginia and Virginia has really changed. The, the politics of Virginia has changed. The population patterns have changed. Northern Virginia, the population has probably doubled or tripled since since then. Um, Virginia used to be, the population centers used to be much more oriented towards Hampton Roads, Richmond and Virginia, Northern Virginia, not so much totally, totally um, uh, concentrated in Northern Virginia. And, um, you know, those changes I think have, have been profound um, in terms of uh, your student body and, and how we deliver services and tax revenue and jobs. The economy is totally different. You know, when I was at JMU, I was one of the only people in my dorm room had a computer and I had a computer that had a three color monitor on it. You know, it, it had three colors in it. Not, you couldn't see a picture like this. You know, it was just three colors. Anyway, uh, if you wanted to use a computer, you had to go down to the computer lab and there were like three computer labs on campus. And if you wanted to print a paper, you had to go walk halfway across campus to print your paper. And, you know, today I'm sure you all obviously carry around more computing power in your pocket than, than, you know, than I had on my 20 megabyte hard drive and my, my uh, computer I played Zork on in my, in my dorm room in Garber Hall. But um, you also, we didn't have cameras. <laughs> and I can only imagine how much trouble I would have gotten into if I had a camera in my pocket uh, everywhere I went on campus. Um, you know, higher ed majors are totally different. I mean, when I hear the, the choices that my daughter has, the things she wants to concentrate in, the choices are just insane. I mean, it seems to me like I could choose between like, political science, history, English, international relations, you know, some science majors, stuff like that. But you guys have so many sub majors under those now, you can really specialize your education in a way that wasn't really possible when I was a student. Um, the fight to get in is a lot harder. Social media didn't exist. I, I, it's hard for me to even remember how I found out where parties were. Um, so I, 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 uh, I can only imagine how different it is there now today and um, and, and the, the, the different pressures that puts on people. And, uh, you know, higher ed, in terms of higher ed advocacy, uh, you know, what I'll say, I mentioned this earlier in my opening remarks, but when I was a student at JMU, the state paid for about two thirds of my cost to go to school. And today the state only picks up about one third. And all the cost cutting that led to that started right when I was at JMU in that first recession. And I feel very strongly that's something that's got to change. We need to get our support levels at the state back up to where the state's picking up two thirds of the cost and families are only paying for a third if you're in state, because I think the affordability of higher education is, is really, really critical. And that's something I fight for every year. I know uh, Kirk does as well. He, he, uh, he's put in a couple of bills about that. Um, we, we passed legislation regulating student loan lenders in Virginia. Um, we have to fight for buildings. One of my first trips to Richmond was in 1991. I was in student government. I went to lobby for the, the third floor on Carrier Library, and which didn't get built until after I left. But last year, Charlie King, the vice president, came down and asked me if I could lobby for the, the new Carrier Library. <laughs> so, you know, it goes in circles. So anyways, those are some of the things that I've seen. I'm sure Kirk's got a, had a few more years to look at things, and he probably has some very unique thoughts. Now, Scott did a good job of, I think, especially talking about how things have changed now. Scott, I, let's go now back to 77, 78, where you had no PCs. You had the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature. So you had this big card catalog. So you look up magazines individually. So your ability to research things to the drop of a hat. Even today, as Scott was saying, I was trying to look up some fun things to include. You can just Google them and they come right up. It would take me three hours to do that research. Back in 1977, there was no East Campus. Uh, UREC was, to me, when that was built, that was uh, like revolutionary. That's how far back I go. So it's, it's changed dramatically. Uh, the two or three things I'll probably add to what Scott said is, and this is good and bad. I mean, there's been a revolution, obviously, in online learning. We, we had none of that. So today, for example, you have uh, the Online Virginia Network, which is a consortium of ODU and um, also George Mason. Madison has now joined that. It's all the community colleges. And it's geared at about the 1.1 million uh, adult learners who started some college and never finished. Uh, the bricks and mortar model, which still I think is very viable. I, I, look, I'm a classroom teacher, so there's nothing like classroom interaction. 
But the reality is that if you're a working mom or you are a, a two working uh, person family, you might not be able to go to a bricks and mortar institution on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and Tuesday, and Thursday. So probably the biggest change I've seen is, you know, the advent of online and online degrees. Uh, how can you make that cost more affordable? And that's uh, how can you come up with a single platform? The future of higher education might be that when you're going to get an online degree, it's not necessarily just from Madison. It might be the best course from Tech or the best course from UVA. You might get the entire first two years from community college, tap into Madison's expert in nursing or communications. It's going to look totally different. So you're probably seeing that revolution. COVID has accelerated that. Y'all been through that. Uh, so that that's a, a big thing. The other thing I've seen that's really changed, uh, and I think for the better, we have a real emphasis today on it's not your daddy's factory for. So there's been a little bit of a stigma by career in tech and kids that want to get credentials and, you know, various computer applications or welding, et cetera. There are, to me, a lot better programs in those types of things now. Businesses partner much better with community colleges, et cetera, to get kids those types of credentials, to get them really good, high-paying jobs. It's really important for us to realize that not every kid's going to go and be a liberal arts major or go to school for four years. So having those are very important. Having degrees line up where the jobs are is something I've worked hard on. Boy, Scott hit a big issue, and that's affordability. And it's really become unaffordable. He did a good job explaining the two-thirds, one-third, uh, and how that has changed dramatically, especially since the 2010 recession. You know, we worked really hard on a bipartisan basis to freeze tuition last year, uh, first time I think in 20 years. Uh, that's a start. Uh, we need to do a lot more, obviously, in that area. I did something that I have to admit made some of my JMU alumni very, not very happy. Uh, I think sometimes auxiliary fees and student fees have gotten a little bit out of hand. We have seen almost exponential growth on the auxiliary side as compared to sometimes the academic side. I, that worries me. Um, and look, there's no bigger guy that loves athletics more than Kirk Cox. I mean, I was never going to do this. I was going to be a famous basketball and baseball coach. Uh, but frankly, it's gotten a bit out of control. If you look at student fees on athletics, we had some colleges, almost $2,000 uh, per student. Now think about that. 3% of kids play an NCAA sport. We've got to look at things like that. I put a bill in that basically would sort of take your university, whether you were FCS or FBS, uh, the top five football programs or the lower levels, and sort of gear them to your peers. And you had to bring down your student fees sort of where your peers were. And some people weren't happy about that. But if we don't get control of some of those uh, athletic fees or fees just in, in, in general, so the affordability issue, as Scott said, is absolutely huge. Uh, it worries me that a lot of um, middle-class families are getting priced out. There's some really big issues in higher ed, uh, probably more in Northern Virginia, where there's um, this frustration from a lot of parents of not being able to get their kids in the really good schools like JMU and Virginia Tech, UVA, Radford. That, that's a problem. I get questions all the time from parents. Hey, my kid's got this great grade point average. He did all the activities. And I can't get them in a Virginia school. So those those are very, very big issues. Um, but I always like to enter on a positive note. Uh, the choices, as Scott said, are so much more vast than when I went through. Um, the, the good use of technology, not for technology's sake, some of the teaching techniques I really like. Uh, and look, I, I love lecture. I was a lecturer, but some of the hybrid models and the collaborative models are really good. So there, there's a lot good going on. There's a lot that could be done better. And so uh, I think it's incumbent on us as legislators uh, to really make sure that we're supporting higher ed in the right in the right way. And uh, so, so I think that's the goal of both of us. Well, thank you both so much for that, for walking us through a little bit of your time here at JMU and, and the opportunities ahead of us and the challenges that we're facing uh, here in higher ed. 
One other challenge I, I want to talk about a little bit at the national level is, is sometimes the news media can portray politics as a zero-sum game, where one party can't advance their agenda unless it's at the expense of the other side. So I'm hoping uh, that you all can talk to us a little bit about how things really worked on a day-to-day -day basis in the state legislature. Um, Delegate Cox, can I ask you to, to go ahead and start with this one? Yeah, Caitlin, I will. I, I alluded a little bit in my opening remarks to this. But it really has gotten to be the perception, certainly among the media, is a little bit of a zero sum game. And I mentioned some legislation, but I, I could give you 10, 15, 20 examples of very serious legislation that both parties worked very hard on. I, I, I mentioned the coal ash issue, which I know Scott worked very hard on. But, you know, things like I'll give you an example. We had something called the grand larceny threshold. And so if you steal over a certain amount of money, that's a felony. That's a very serious thing. You go to jail for a long time. And Democrats, a little bit more than Republicans, uh, wanted to see that raised. It, it was a reasonable argument to raise it. Now, the fear was, obviously, if, if you raise it too high, then is there not enough to turn? And so uh, we had to be convinced that we wanted to do that, that that was a good thing. One of the things Republicans had really pushed for was restitution and making sure that if you are a victim of crime, there's a restitution fund or some other things. Are we doing enough in that area? Uh, and so the compromise basically was we raised the grand, threshold, uh, the grand larceny threshold and we did a lot more on the restitution side. So both sides got you know, some of their priorities and it ended up being a very, very good bill. Uh, veterans issues I mentioned. Uh, we have uh, really, and, and we all thank the veterans at the beginning, we do that from the bottom of our heart. We, we know how difficult that service is. So we, we thought, so what's the number one veterans issue? What can we really do to help them? And, and the one thing that I have a real heart for is when they transition out of the military, do we have good jobs for them? Are we doing smart, practical things? Well, let's talk about higher ed a little bit. So if you're a medic in the field or you're a corpsman, you've been over to Iraq or Afghanistan, you've experienced firsthand some really crisis situations in healthcare. You've probably done things in the field in the hospital setting that almost no one in healthcare has done. So you come back to the States and you don't qualify sometimes for the most basic healthcare jobs. You have this incredible field experience. So why shouldn't you get credit for that, what you've done in the field? And we, we made a big step towards uh, that type of thing. And, and so I, I could you know, give you tons of uh, veterans issues like that. I also think there are, you know, things like ID and DD waivers. And one thing I think we all have a heart for are parents that have either intellectually disabled or developmentally disabled kids. And they're fantastic parents. I mean, they want their kids to stay at home. Uh, they work with them and, and they have tremendous potential. My brother has a Down syndrome daughter and there's something called an, uh, an ID waiver or a DD waiver. And that allows you to get respite services where you can work more, leave your home. It allows you to get accommodations as far as outfitting your home. It allows you a whole host of specialists and folks to come in and work with your son or daughter. And sometimes they're adults. And we have, uh, Virginia's not done very well there. We've been 48, 49th, um, you know, pretty low as far as granting those number of waivers. And what that translates to is we have almost 10,000 people on a waiting list to get those waivers. And both sides have worked pretty hard to try to, to bring that down. Um, the Department of Justice actually has required us to do some of that, but we've done some of that on, the own, on our own. I could go over issue after issue after issue that is like that where we work together and I think that's uh, that's really, really important. So there's a lot of stuff, once again, that's done on a bipartisan basis. And there's nothing wrong with disagreeing. Uh, boy, that, that's what our republic's all about. I mean, Scott and I are going to disagree on certain things. I and mean, we have core philosophies that, that are different. I, I respect his. I mean, and I'll give you a very controversial one. I mean, with people, and that's the issue of abortion. I'm, I'm very pro-life. And that is something that, uh, you know, it, it is a core issue with me. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we can't have really robust discussions, uh, you know, about a whole host of issues. And I can't respect, you know, where other people's core foundational principles are. And I'm going to end with this. Uh, There's a great book that I think Chris Matthews wrote dealing with Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan. And 
once again, I'm not sure how many of your audience remember Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan real well, but that goes back to the 1980s. But boy, they were adversaries. I mean, they didn't agree on hardly anything public policy wise, but they respected each other and they had this great relationship. And when Ronald Reagan was shot, after his family left his hospital room, the story goes, the first person they lit in to visit him was Tip O'Neill. And Tip, Tip O'Neill went in and, and, and grabbed Ronald Reagan's hand and said, Mr. President, and Ronald Reagan lit up. They had a very good friendship. And he drops on his knees and recites the 23rd Psalm. And, uh, and, and they used to always have this great saying was, uh, after six o'clock, let's forget about politics. And so, you know, once again, with that kind of attitude, I think we can get a lot done. So uh, I was reading uh, I was reading an email or something. I think it was a JMU Madison magazine or something in like the last 48 hours. And I saw a quote from Pete Geeson, uh, former JMU professor, state delegate. And he said that uh, they used to play basketball uh, when he served in the house. And I said, wait a minute, we still play basketball. <laughs> so every Tuesday night we play basketball uh, in anticipation of the most boring basketball game you'll ever watch when the House and the Senate go at each other. Uh, I, th I think the most points have ever been scored is maybe about 40 or maybe 50 when we bring in some ringers. But, but uh, you know, I don't know if you all watch Looney Tunes. I mean, I'm probably dating myself. When I was a kid, I watched Looney Tunes. And there's one where the, the coyote and, the, and, the, and the, um, the bloodhound go out and fight and fight and fight and fight every day or they they come in they check in they hit the punch clock and they start fighting and then they walk out check the punch clock and they go out and and go have a beer together and it's that's kind of how how a lot of it works um but kirk kirk's exactly right that it's it's a a lot of it is very collaborative um he's he's talked a couple times about coal ash and you know the coal ash problem is a it was a multi-billion dollar problem that there's four coal ash dumps in the state and I started working on it about, I don't know, six years ago when I got elected to the Senate because one of them was in my district and the biggest one happens to be in Kirk's district. And uh, I finally got a bill in a position where I could get it passed. And uh, there came a point in time where I had to go see the speaker <laughs> to make sure my bill would pass. And the speaker had a few things he wanted to make sure that his, his district was taken care of and the, the coal ash problem was dealt with in a specific way in his area because of the ways that removing 12 million cubic yards of toxic stuff would have affected his constituents. And, and, you know, we, we, we included that in the bill. It made the bill cost a, maybe it, maybe a little tiny bit more, but it was something that was important to them. And, you know, that bill wasn't passing unless the speaker said it was going to pass. <laughs> so um, it, uh, you know, you have to work with the other side if you want to get things done. And by the way, when I passed that bill, I was in the minority in, in, in the Senate. Um, and so I had to figure out a way to get a bill out of my chamber that that had some Republican votes on it or else I wasn't going to get a bill. And so to get that multi-billion dollar important thing done for myself and for the state, it had to be a bipartisan collaborative effort. There wasn't any way around that. And that's the way many of these things work. And um, another example, which I know Kirk was very deeply involved in, was Medicaid expansion. Uh, Medicaid expansion happened on a, a, bipartisan, a bipartisan basis. Um, if you think back in time, Mark Warner's tax increase in 2003, which was one of the biggest in injections of money into the general fund, which helps underwrite your tuition. That was a bipartisan effort where I think, Kirk can correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say 15, 16, 17 Republicans crossed over to, to with Democrats to, to get that through, to work with a Democratic governor who was working with a Republican legislature to make that happen. George Allen um, abolished parole back in 1995 with bipartisan votes. It took Democrats and Republicans. It was a Democratic controlled House of Delegates back then. So, um, you know, a lot of these things happen that way. I, I've been trying to get, and you know, it's, and you, you can't you can't go down there and be a partisan war, warrior if you wanna be effective. Um, I've, that's something I've discovered. I mean, th there's a time and a place to, to play that role and, and where you have to stand up and fight for your people and your district and your values. And, and I'm, I'm happy and proud to do that often but you have to do it in a way where you don't make a lot of enemies uh or else you're, you're going to be ineffective and i mean you know the first six years i served i was in the house um, of delegates I, when i got there we had 39 members after the 2011 elections we went down to 32 maybe even 31 and being one of 
31 in a body of 100 is a lonely place to be because uh, it's kind of hard to get things done. I mean, it's hard to pass a bill when you have to get 20 people from the other side to cross over and support your bill every single time you want to get a bill done. And But um, I fought every day, and um, I'm, I'm sure Kirk remembers me fighting every day. I felt I felt like... <laughs> I felt like to me, I, I felt like it was uh, Tiananmen Square. And I don't know if you, that's another thing that happened when I was in college. But in China, you know, they 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 had they shut down a democracy protest. And the famous picture out of Tiananmen was this one little guy standing in front of a tank like this to get attention. And I felt like that's what I had to do every day on the floor to get anybody to pay attention to me because, you know, we were basically a speed bump whenever the majority wanted to make policy. And And I did that in a way without incurring a lot of hostile feelings because then when I went over to the Senate, when we were 21, 19 and I was able to get bills over to the house, everybody in the house didn't hate me and I was able to still get bills through uh, because I, you know, I, I did what I did with while earning their respect. And so you, you have to, you know, um, you also never know when, when the majorities are going to change. And, um, you know, um, we just went through a change in the house of delegates. We just went through a change in the Senate, but it's still very close. Um, Virginia's politics tends to, you know, go with go with the, the opposite of the presidency from time to time. And so you never know when you're going to be in the minority and you need those relationships on either side. And so you just can't be burning bridges all the time. You have to work together. So um, what goes around comes around. That's one of the things I remember the most. So and some of my best friends, actually, that I work with in in depth on bills are um, are Republicans. I mean, a lot of bills I carry are, are uh, sort of court related bills, lawyer related bills. Some of the Republican lawyers that I deal with in both the House and the Senate are some of the people I work most closely on, with on it. And they're not really partisan issues. They're, they're bills that sort of lawyers understand and lawyers work on together to come up with a good policy. And then we try and sell it to our caucus. But, um, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have our fights, but the and the press will cover the fights because that's what the press likes to cover. And it makes for a lot, again, a lot more interesting YouTube clips when somebody's on the floor, you know, yelling and, and making noise. But, um, but if, if you know to get a hundred and what is it now, hundred and thirty-five billion dollar budget, two-year budget done, and and to get through three thousand bills, uh, that doesn't happen with us, you know, ripping each other apart every day. That that wouldn't, we wouldn't get anything done. We'd be like Congress <laughs> if uh, if we operated like that. We don't do that. And the the fact that we have a deadline, by the way, uh, Kirk mentioned it earlier. But the fact that that I have to pay my mortgage by practicing law. <laughs> and not by serving in the state legislature means that everybody wants to get out of there when session's over and having a deadline when it all ends and we, when we have to have a budget passed is very useful in terms of making us compromise and get to conclusion on things. We're not like Congress where we can just pass some law and keep getting our paycheck and just deal with the budget next year. We have to get everything done by a deadline so we can all go home so we can still pay our mortgage at the end of the day. And and so that's, I think, one of the, the beauties of a part-time legislature as well, which is very different from how Congress operates. They can just keep kicking cans down the road and borrowing money all day long. We have to balance our budget, and we have to get things done by a deadline, and it forces compromise. Thank you for that. I feel like you both spoke well to how inaccurate media portrayals can be sometimes. Um, going off of that, politics has changed significantly. Um, in the recent years due to the impact of social media. Can you talk about how the explosion of social media has impacted bipartisanship? I think additionally students in the audience might wonder if bipartisanship has been influenced solely by social media coverage of politics in general, or if they're also influenced by specific exchanges or general trends in social media discussions. Yeah. So you want me to start, Scott? No, you, you go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, and then we'll alternate back and forth. On, on that one, um, it's really interesting. And once again, I started in the legislature, Scott mentioned Doug Wilder. I came in with Doug Wilder. So that sort of historic election. Uh, so that's way back in 1989. And in those days, and I even go further back in my childhood, there were three, there were really three stations. Uh, this is embarrassing to admit, 12, 8, and 6, NBC, ABC, and CBS. And it was a totally different model. You had a model where everyone sort of corporately watched the news that the news wasn't segmented where you could sort of watch what you'd like to watch. The, the thing, and it's good and bad. I, I hate when everybody goes, oh, everything's horrible today. That's not true at all. The thing I do not like is when I first got to the General Assembly, we had reporters for every news outlet, both radio, TV, and especially print, 
that had been there 10, 15, 20 years. So they knew the budget. They knew various issues. So whether it be coal ash or as Scott said, you know, $135 billion budget, they would ask you very tough questions. They were very knowledgeable about state government. That was their passion. We don't have that anymore. I mean, we, and this is, we have reporters, it's not their fault. They're, they're on much lower budgets. They're covering everything from sports half the time to what went on with this recent crime to, hey, run over there and cover the General Assembly on this complicated coal ash bill. You almost feel like you're explaining the basics of the bill and you can't even get to a lot of the really good policy you want to talk about. And that's not a good thing. I mean, that's not a good thing. It's much more superficial. It's very hard to have a, to me, a substantive conversation sometimes on those issues. And I, and I think that is really, that is hurt. And, and we all know the other negative piece about social media is, you know, you're, you're a bit faceless when you're tweeting and doing other things. So people a lot of times don't have much of compunction to uh, say some things that there's no way they would say in a debate when you know someone and uh, you respect their values, you're just not going to blurt out some of those things. And that's, that's also not a good trend. You know, I can be doing a major uh, announcement on public policy piece and I try to be good with my mask, but so someone's tweeting, I'm outside, there's no one around me. Then someone's tweeting that, Hey, gotcha. You don't have this or that or the other. So that part, I think we can, we can greatly improve on, but let me tell you what's good. What's good is we have a lot more transparency than when I got in. Uh, Pete Geeson, which Scott mentioned, would tell me that when he first got in, the Appropriations Committee, which is our budget committee, and boy, something that should be transparent is your budget committee. They actually had Capitol Police officers outside the door of the committee room. And you weren't allowed in as a member if you weren't a member of Appropriations. And uh, in, in even over recent years, and we've improved on this, you know, we now have many more recorded votes. You have streaming of various committee meetings. So there's a lot of good that goes on. I, you know, we shouldn't always say, hey, the good old days, because a lot of the good old days, that part, the transparency part was not very good. And we can avail ourselves of this medium. For example, this is great. I mean, we didn't have this when I first got in. I could have never talked to you in this fashion. I would have had to come on campus uh, and it, it would have been totally different. Uh, we do things like teletown hall meetings uh, in my district, and I can have eight, 900 people on a teletown hall meeting at one time asking me questions in a queue. Uh, I, it's got a polling feature. I can ask them what they think about this particular issue. That's, that's neat technology. So it all comes down to, to me on social media, how responsibly you're going to use the technology. Uh, and I hate to say it, you're going to use it for good or bad. Uh, what are your motives? And we can do better. Uh, but let's avail ourselves of some of the things that really affords you to do in, in a democracy. Uh, the mention of Tiananmen Square, but the uh, just looking at some of the things that have happened uh, in history in the recent years that are, you know, Democrat forces that have bubbled up, w that would not have happened if it had not been for social media and the ability to do that. So good and bad. Um, i like to see a lot more serious coverage. i like to see, uh, you know, people stop just tweaking each other on social media, but uh, there's some good aspects to it too. Scott? Yeah, I've been so negative on social media lately. It's good to hear you talk about some of the positive things because I haven't been thinking that way lately, but you're right. There are, there are a lot of good things that it, that it is. And it definitely has allowed me to communicate with my constituents, I think a lot more effectively. And at least I feel like it allows me to broaden awareness of, state policy issues which where i live in northern virginia where we have five t had five tv stations <laughs> uh one of one of which was good for cartoons but not much news but uh but uh in northern virginia the federal government tends to rule the roost and state and local tends to be a total afterthought and so um being able to communicate directly with constituents by email or 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 facebook twitter um my kids tell me i should use instagram um, I don't have a Snapchat, but anyway, um, it's, it's all useful, but, uh, you know, I, I really feel like, um, that social media has, uh, I think sort of led to more partisanship, um, generally, uh, you know, 
many you know p- many people you know a lot of this the, the, a lot of the, a lot has been coming out in the last few years about how facebook and twitter built their algorithms and their models and the sort of human vulnerabilities that they prey upon to to drive traffic and hold traffic on their networks and i think that those you know people seeking out likes and seeking out twitter followers and facebook followers and all that kind of stuff i think uh, has has definitely some negative externalities create some problems within the political system. And, um, you know, some people would say, well, like Cervell, you're one to talk. I've got probably one of the higher counts when it comes to Twitter followers or Facebook followers, uh, in the legislature. But, um, you know, uh, it, it doesn't always make for good policy. Um, uh, the, um, Kirk talks about the video cameras, you know, the, the sessions that we sit on and both in committee, we started streaming committees more recently, but, floor sessions have been streamed now since I've been there. I don't know how long Kirk, maybe like 20 years now or something. There've been video cameras in the chamber, but, but you know, the fact that there's a video camera in the chamber and that you can have a YouTube channel (laughs) means people are a lot more likely to give speeches. And a lot of times those speeches aren't changing any minds, but the speeches are given more for the constituents back at home or to burn the YouTube clip for a fundraising email or something, maybe after sessions over than they are to try and change some minds. And I'm not sure that that all that is necessarily always, always useful. Um, in terms of my constituents, uh, I feel that, um, you know, the, 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 the presence now of, of social media and the ability to self-select your information instead of having to get it filtered through, um, through a major news source where they have standards and vetting has really resulted in people sort of, um, retreating to their tribes. Um, if you're if you're progressive or you're conservative, it's very easy to just go get the information that you want to get and not to have to listen to the other side at all. And I think a big part of the reason we have as much partisanship as we do in our country today is because it's very difficult sometimes for people to even agree upon the facts because many people aren't even exposed to all the facts because they only get their information from one side or the other. And I'm not I'm not casting blame on one side. It's it's a mutual problem here today. And um and you know the fact that that we as politicians can communicate without the filter of the media filtering through what we have to say as our president does regularly i think can create can create um can create problems um you know from my perspective it's high time that we we had more regulation on these social media companies because i think um that just a complete 100 percent unfettered free flow of ideas is not it's it's not always positive. I mean, um, it used to be that people who were um, sort of, you know, disaffected, uh, paranoid, angry, whatever, they, you know, they, they didn't really engage much. But today, I think they all find each other in some of these places and organize, and it results in some of the sort of worst parts of our politics that we see today. And um, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that it, as we start going forward, people will start to see the the negative consequences of social media and what it does to our political system and maybe start to uh, pump the brakes a little bit on, on what we have out there right now, because I, I think it's a big part of the problem in terms of the partisanship and the anger. Um, you know, um, but by the way, people have been communicating anonymously forever. Kirk talked about how it's easy to go out there with a, you know, an anonymous Twitter account and mouth off. And I think it's way too easy remember the Federalist Papers were written anonymously. So anonymous communications are not something new, but the, the cost to communicate anonymously used to be a lot more. I mean, you couldn't, you know, if you want to communicate, anom- like when I was at JMU my senior year, a group of students formed a newspaper called the Madison Review. And they, I think they published some anonymous stuff in it, but you know, it took a lot of time and money to go out and <laughs> write up an article in a magazine and distribute it all over campus. Today, you just throw it up on a, you know, in, in, in two seconds on a tweet. And uh, and it, it's it's become too easy, I think. So um, I'm, I'm definitely hopeful that we can uh, we can do something about that going forward because I think our political dialogue, in a lot of ways, has become a little bit too aggressive in a lot of ways. Well, I certainly heard some notes of hopefulness there um, in that answer. Um, and I do want to return to Delegate Cox, Senator Servell. You both talked a little bit about what could possibly be perceived as a solution, right, to bipartisanship. I, I heard responsible use of technology, transparency, broadening access to information. Um, can you all possibly, and, and this will be my last question, Ashley, we'll, we'll end with another question and then we'll move into some um, 
participant questions, but can you all just maybe expand a little bit on that concept of, of what is the solution to bipartisanship and specifically and importantly, as a university, what role do we have to play? Um, as the university and our students here at the university, uh, what role do they have? Uh, well, you know, what I would say is, um, first of all, it's dialogue. Uh, you know, it's it's so easy just to retreat to your your peer group, people that agree with you, people that are like you, people that are from the same place you're from. And and one of the things that's sort of fascinated me about having served in Richmond for 11 years is that, you know, when, I was a, when you come to college, right, you're exposed to people from all over the Commonwealth. You can choose to socialize with them or you don't have to. But when you once you graduate and you go back home to where you live, you basically end up more or less mostly socializing with a peer group that's pretty much like you are, you know, often same career fields, same neighborhoods, same whatever. When I come back to, when I go to Richmond, I'm forced to talk to a lot of Republicans. <laughs> I'm forced to talk to a lot of people that live in other parts of the state. I'm forced to talk with other people who have a completely different life experience that I do. And, and, you know, it, it really affects your, um, the, the way you see the world and, and, and your, your, your tolerance as a person. And, and I just wish that, that more people could could have that experience on a daily basis. I think that if if we um, had more conversation with people who weren't like us, uh, we'd we'd have a much more empathetic society and much less conflict. We wouldn't agree about everything, of course, and we wouldn't. It's not like you know rainbows would come out and the clouds would part and everything would be great. And we'd figure everything out, but at least we'd be able to figure things out without punching each other in the face so much. And so, first thing I would say is try to maintain your relationships and try to try to try to seek out people who are not like you not don't have your life experience aren't from the same place you are try to have that broad peer peer network to rely upon on a regular basis um, likewise i would say it's important to seek out information that you don't want to that you don't want to read um, you know i every once in a while i'll turn on fox news just because i want to see what they're saying <laughs> it's a whole different world over there and I want to see what's being said over there so that um, I have an understanding of what the people who are yelling at me on my Facebook page every day, <laughs> what they're seeing and what's causing them to say this. So I have an understanding of what's of what where they're coming from, because if I didn't do that, I wouldn't you know, it's, it's a lot easier just to dismiss it and not listen. And you can't do that, especially if you're an elected official, for God's sakes, if you have to represent. I mean, I, I have to represent everybody I represent, regardless of their of their politics. But it's just important as a human being to be able to understand that. And, you know, actually one of the most fascinating things I love to do is knocking doors in my district. Um, when I go over to the other side of US-1 and I start knocking doors of folks who live in the apartments over there and I see what their lives are like on an everyday basis and I talk to them about what's important to them, it just, it, 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 it completely changes your point of view about things. And, you know, um, just to give you a really quick example, you know, I, I would go out to the, um, um, I, my district is 20 some percent, 20, 20, 23 percent, something like that, Hispanic. And um, I had an Hispanic town hall and I get up, put on this big PowerPoint and I said, you know, we're going to do this on Medicaid and education. And we're going to bring this new bus line down Route 1 and transit. It's all going to be great. I went on for 45 minutes and I said, what are your questions? And the first question was, when are you going to get us a driver's license? <laughs> I mean, I, the number one issue to them was not anything I had talked about. And everybody in there was like, yes, we need a driver's license, you know, and actually the bill I just passed last session was to give undocumented immigrants driver's licenses. But, you know, if I hadn't gone out and reached out and talked to them, I wouldn't have had a, a clue. Right. And so um, it's important to, to, to have that dialogue and seek out that information um, and, and have a peer group you can rely on um, and, and just try not to get so much of your information from social media, please. I probably sound like a broken record on that, but Social media is not somewhere where you want to get information. You need to find it in other ways. There's there's other and better ways. And I probably sound like some crusty old fart saying that, but but that's 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 the that's the reality. Um, um, I think I think if if um, in a JMU, I hope that the school. I, I assume the school still um, uh, has a very robust student uh, non non academic student life experience. Some of the my best memories were the fights I had in student government uh, fighting with now Senator Ryan McDougal, who he and I were in the state, the student Senate together for three years uh, uh, doing some of the same things that we do today. Um, but 
Um, I know there's a lot of student organizations that sometimes sponsor forums and debates. I mean, it's important to be able to have debates and fights without condemning each other. Um, actually, WXJM, which I, I think it just come into, I guess it, I can't remember if it had just started when I was there, but my senior year, some guy named Jim Acosta started a talk show. <laughs> and uh, you all probably know Jim Acosta, but he, he, he ran for student government president and lost. And then he went on to host this uh, student talk show on WXJM. And he used to talk about some very difficult issues and people would call in. And, and, and that's, that's the kind of way I think the school can facilitate dialogue was, is just create, creating those opportunities for students to have dialogue where they're not uh, you know, t taking each other apart. Yeah, well said. Um, it's interesting. I went from a 62% Republican district because of uh, judicial uh, redistricting to a 46% Republican district. So I have the only Hillary Clinton uh, Democrat district in the House of Delegates the Republican has in the state because we're very polarized. Boy, that's a different experience. And to Scott's point, you, you can do two or three things there. You can just keep hitting your base over and over again or get out your comfort zone a little bit and then go walk your areas that are not your areas. So I got 30,000 new voters and uh, mostly not from my party. Good folks. I actually taught in some of those schools. So you go out and knock and you, uh, and you really find out how they, you know, their life experiences, they, they give you great opinions. You don't agree on everything. You really listen from a different perspective. That was great for me. I did silly stuff. I, I did a big fall festival uh, in the new part of my district. And boy, I think we had a thousand people. And I just got to sit all afternoon. It doesn't have to be always serious. I got to sit down and just, you know, talk to all kinds of families, et cetera. And to, to Scott's point, I mean, um, they have some real challenges. I mean, they, I mean, whether it be K-12, uh, boy, we talk about JMU and higher ed. I mean, they're, they're just struggling to, you know, make ends meet. So um, that that was a really good experience. Uh, and I love the idea of getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, and, and we don't do that. We used to call it teaching narrow casting. So you sort of you just narrow down to sort of your group only. And it's an echo chamber. Um, teaching was good for me because when you're a K-12 teacher, it's really incumbent on you to give both sides. I mean, that's what you're there for. So to his point, I mean, I'm opposite. I, I tend to watch Fox and then I have to go watch CNN and MSNBC. And, and of course, I did that as a teacher because I got to know what everyone else is saying. And if I'm presented where it's uh, fair and, you know, reading, you know, different publications, uh, left, right, center, and it gives you a great perspective. And boy, not many people are doing that anymore. Uh, and I would say on the university level, uh, there was years ago, uh, I guess William Buckley was considered sort of the conservative icon. He was the intellectual sort of mover of the conservative movement. And Daniel Patrick Moynihan was a very, very well-known intellectual Democrat. And as I recall, years ago, they went around the nation debating, which I thought was a great concept. And uh, all, all the great issues of the day, they were good friends. They were passionate about what they believed. And don't I don't think you want to misunderstand us. It is very important to have a core. Uh, we're not saying that at all. It is respecting the other person's opinion. On university campuses, that's essential. That an atmosphere is created where you have enough confidence that, that you, you like debating your ideas. As he said, I, I love the Ryan and him exchange. I had friends like that too. Uh, you, you should want to do that. Uh, you know, you've worked hard to develop your philosophies and what you believe, and you should want to get there in the marketplace of ideas and, and you know, and articulate that uh, and, and, you know, see how they stand up to scrutiny, which is very, very important. And we don't always have that. Now we sort of retreat to our corners and we talk to our own groups and, and that's a really fallacy. So if, if I, and I, I like this series for this reason, uh, but I would challenge college students to, uh, to do that, you know, they just don't dislike the other person because they're on the other side and you're hanging around your friends and they dislike that other person. So that we're not going to get there if we do that. Um, so that's to me the challenge of higher ed is can we have it should be the it should be the place where these debates are going on more than any place else. Uh, 
So that, uh, I think that's essential and, and hopefully we'll, we'll get there. Right now, I'm just going to jump in. So um, let's talk about redistricting. Uh, and Ashley, I promise I'll let you get we have a we're sitting on a pretty fun question, but we did get a user question. and I don't want to let it go by. So um, and Delegate Cox, maybe you can take us away with this. Matthew asks, um, last week, Virginia approved a constitutional amendment creating a redistricting commission to draw legislative districts. Do you expect this commission to better serve bipartisanship? Well, I voted for it. Uh, you know, I have an interesting perspective on that. Uh, if you go back, you know, historically in the U.S. Constitution and the state constitution, redistricting has been like left to the state legislatures. And uh, and I've been through three redistrictings, uh, one under Democrats, two under Republicans. Uh, and it was a very hard fought compromise. Uh, and so it, it was interesting, as you know, for a constitutional amendment to pass in Virginia, it has to pass a, legislate, a legislature an intervening election. The theory behind that is that if you think we really made a bad decision, you should let us know in the election and maybe kick us out. It generally doesn't go that far, but you can at least hear from your constituents about what they thought about that decision. So the first year, uh, the nonpartisan redistricting, which is a hybrid bill passed, it was 51-49 in the House of Delegates, which you can imagine was very interesting. And no one knew who was gonna be in the majority. Uh, I was hoping as speaker we were going to be in the majority. Boy, I fought for that. That's all I did for eight months. Democrats felt pretty confident that they had the momentum on their side and they were going to win. So it was an interesting point to be at. Uh, and it passed. Then the legislature flipped, as you know, and the Senate and the House go Democrat. Uh, a little bit different debate. Uh, it's got to pass in identical form both years. And it passes... Uh, the Senate a little bit more easily. Scott might have different perspectives. I think Scott voted no. I could be wrong. Uh, he can explain that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in the House, it was really contentious uh, with the Democrats. But I thought it was a good compromise. I mean, basically, and I, I won't drone on for 30 minutes about how it how it's done. But it has eight legislators and eight citizens. It requires a supermajority. Um, most people have really been pushing for something where they felt like we weren't I don't want to exaggerate, but we weren't sort of in the computer room drawing the lines to political advantage. They wanted something that uh, looked different than that. Now, some people wanted what was considered a truly independent, no legislators involved commission. Uh, I wasn't for that. I, I, I felt like legislators should have a role, uh, but maybe not as much of a role. So I was for it. Uh, it was a very interesting to talk about it out there on the campaign trail. Uh, at first, if you looked at the polling data, a fairly overwhelming amount of Democrats were for it. Republicans were more skeptical. It was in, in the 40, 45% range. Uh, that grew a lot towards election day. It's interesting, a lot of Republicans hate changing the constitution. They are, they are very big, and this is a, a fundamental principle that, well, you better give me a good reason why I'm changing a the fundamental document. But the way that redistricting worked was that clearly we had that responsibility. You had to change the Constitution. So there were some interesting arguments both ways. Uh, but to answer your question, I, I was for it. I voted for it. Uh, I was out on the campaign trail uh, advocating for it. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll end with this. I had an interesting experience. Uh, when we did the last redistricting, the Democrats challenged that and ended up in federal court. And, uh, it, and it went round and round the federal courts. It, we got a two to one favorable decision in the lower court. It went to the Supreme Court. They sent it back down. An Obama judge replaced a essentially a Republican Bush judge and flipped the decision and said that we were racially gerrymandered. So a lot of people don't understand this, but the judges don't draw the lines. They send it to a master who then draws the lines. Uh, it was a professor in California, and boy, he didn't draw my lines uh, very favorably. And about five Republicans got some pr pretty tough lines, and I didn't have a real good experience with the federal courts and to me sort of how they did it. Uh, this uh, particular amendment, when you actually, when the citizen and legislative panel come up with the lines, you either reject them up or down, like the old base closing commission. Uh, the legislature can, cannot amend it. The governor has no role whatsoever. Eventually, if you cannot 
solve the problem, the state Supreme Court makes that decision. I'm more comfortable with the state courts than the federal courts. So, so I was for it. Well, uh, I was against it. <laughs> and like John Kerry, I voted for it before I voted against it. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and first of all, Kirk, I think it's important for you to know I got a text message that apparently that, that Matthew on that question was your former government student who's a, now a lawyer with me in Fairfax. So um, Matt Kensky, who's also a JMU alum, graduated a couple of years after me. So, um, but uh, I, um, uh, yeah, I voted against the bill. I, I thought um, when it came through, we had very, the first time, we had very little time to actually read it the compromise popped out at the very end of session and it was, you know, this much text. And we had, I think, you know, I think we had maybe 24 hours to look at it and debate it. It, it was, a, it, it popped out like the very, very end. And we, you know, at the end of session, you got all this stuff going down, all the big bills are coming down right at the end of session. And you're sort of counting on your conferees to your, who are the people who are writing the big controversial bills in the special conference committees, you're counting on them to get it right. And, and then after I had a chance to, to look at it, read it, reflect on it um, in the year between sessions, I sort of soured on it. And um, first of all, I do think it will help bipartisanship. I don't I don't disagree with that because, you know, before under our current system, basically the majority writes the lines and the only person they have to fight with typically is if is the governor. If the governor's in a different party, usually the other chamber, the two chambers don't get involved in each other's lines. Usually they just don't play that game, but they could, but they don't. And so by having a bipartisan commission, I don't think there's any question that the parties are going to have to work together to reach some kind of conclusion. And of course, you know, the citizens might sort of inject themselves as well, but the citizens are mostly selected by the legislature. Basically, there's going to be a list submitted by each caucus, then some retired judges have to pick off the list. And so there shouldn't be any real big surprises in terms of the citizens on the commission. So my guess is, my guess, the way it's going to operate is it's going to be sort of a bipartisan deal body where you know, the sides are sort of negotiating with each other to reach districts that are okay, that are everybody's comfortable with. Um, personally, I thought the best way to do this was just to get politicians out of it completely. And I believe that all of this can be done by computer. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of really smart, smart math guys that have come up with formulas to determine compactness and contiguity, where you can reduce those to a variable. And uh, so you could have a range. You can say that, that districts have to be have a certain compactness factor, a certain contiguity factor. They can't exceed that or they have to be within a certain range. They have to have a certain population plus or minus a certain amount. And then uh, most importantly, there's a there's a, a, another professor who developed something called the vote waste formula, which is he developed a mathematical way to look at an entire set of districts and determine how many votes of the voters in those districts are likely to be wasted based on the typical partisan performance of those districts over time. And that way, and you have a variable that says that either districts are drawn extremely in a way to, to waste a lot of votes or in a way that maximizes the votes. And so you could legislate a formula that basically says you have to honor a certain compactness contiguity factor, a certain vote, vote waste, vote waste formula so that the fewest votes are wasted or that, you know, some permissible range of votes are wasted. And then I think you leave it to a set of human beings to make adjustments at the end. Maybe they can say they can deviate the population in a district by plus or minus two or three percent or something like that. And I think if we were to do something like that, you would truly get human beings out of the process where so that nobody would care where my house is when my district, when the 36th district is drawn or nobody cares where anybody lives. Cause that's, I remember when I went through this in 2011, when I was in the minority, I remember when one of the maps came out I remember somebody going like, well, wait a minute, my house isn't in my district. And we're like, well, it's not your district. <laughs> it's the voters district. <laughs> so uh, most voters don't really care where we live or whether we live in the new district. They just want to have representation that reflects their community. And and I, I just think there's a better way to do it. And I also, um, as a lawyer, I was uncomfortable with the idea that the criteria we have, we have a, the, 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 the districts have to be drawn pursuant to a certain criteria. And I just articulated three criteria. Um, but the criteria bill that we passed has, I don't know, about six, seven, eight different criteria that, that the commission is required to follow so that if they don't follow it, a court can come in and say, hey, you, you ignored certain variables when you drew these things. I think that criteria belongs in the Constitution. I don't think it belongs in the code. 
And so by taking the criteria and putting it in the code instead of the Constitution, I think it allows a future legislature to change the criteria that could require a partisan gerrymander, and which I think is what we're really trying to avoid. And so I thought structurally the amendment should have had that criteria included within the constitutional language and not that left out. And so that was another thing that bothered me as an attorney, because when you're messing with your constitution, it's important that you get it perfect because it's so hard to change the constitution. So in any event, um, you know, the amendment passed, it is what it is, and we're going to move forward and we're going to have to figure this out. And that's fine with me. It's what the voters chose to do. And, and I think it will lead to probably, um, it'll probably lead to things shifting around more often is my guess, um, as the winds change in Virginia, which is probably a good thing. It would probably make us more responsive to voters than we are right now. Uh, so that's probably a good thing. And I think it will definitely lead to more bipartisanship. But I thought you know, we'll see long term over the next 40 years, whether it works out the way we, we, we thought it did when we wrote it. Thank you. I think you both just modeled well how students can engage in that kind of difficult or sometimes different conversations with people who don't agree with them, like you encourage them to fill their time with on campus. Can you speak to what your favorite memories are during your time at JMU? Um, yeah, so I, 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 I'm not good at favorites and I thought about this hard. So I'm going to mention two things. One is um, uh, my student government vice presidency race was a lot of fun. Uh, I um. I had three opponents, um, Resha Genevieve, wherever she is today, she was a cheerleader and student government, state student senator. And so she had some visibility and notoriety around campus. It was hard to get anybody to vote. And so if you had some people knew who you were, they recognized you, that helped a little bit, right? Um, and then I had a, another guy who I can't remember, he wasn't very interesting, but then I had Phil Sweeney and Phil Sweeney decided that him and this other guy, Kimberly McLeod, who was that they were both communication students and they'd done all these stunts trying to get national media attention on JMU through the years. They decided they were going to invade our student government election. And so Phil Sweeney ran against me. And back then, you know, we didn't have the internet. So we had to put up campaign posters all over campus. That was the only way you could communicate. And um, I really focused on my two core constituencies, Marching Royal Dukes <laughs> and uh, everybody that worked at PC Dukes. Because I, I was, I worked at PC Dukes. I had to get a job at PC Dukes to pay for my Cancun trip, my uh, sophomore year, and uh, we all had green shirts. And so I had all these posters up that said "Vote Green Shirt" or "Vote MRD." Or and then I, I'm sorry, I was also Greek, and that was my other constituency. I got Greek Row. I went out and I, I worked Greek Row really hard to try and get all of them to vote for me. And um, I'm not going to get into my scheme on that, but. Yeah, I, you had to identify your base and then get your base to vote because nobody voted. So, anyways, that's what I did. And Phil Sweeney. All he wanted was attention. And so we had our debate. And Phil, first of all, his campaign slogan was, his name was Phil Sweeney. And his campaign slogan was, everybody loves Phil's weenie. And his campaign poster had him coming out of a shower with his tower, towel falling off. And he put that all over campus to get notoriety with his sunglasses on. And in our de big student debate, um, he decided to rub peanut butter all over his face while we were having our debate. I'm not sure really what was going on. It was very distracting, but and it was entertaining. But uh, the whole thing was a lot of fun, and uh, I ended up winning. Um, and uh, and I, that 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 it taught me a little bit about politics and and about media too. Uh, the, the other thing I'm going to mention really quick is how to affect change. And uh, Kirk, you play into the story unknowingly, but uh, my uh, senior year at JMU. You know, it, it, I lived on Greek Row my senior year, and back then all the fraternities lived on campus. And uh, uh, we had a, a major crisis that erupted my senior year because some state delegate from uh, Colonial Heights passed a bill requiring the registration of kegs. <laughs> and that's Kirk. I think it was Kirk's first big bill, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, forgot about that one, Scott. Yeah. Okay. So it Greek Row went to this whole like crisis mode because. You know, in order to go buy a keg of beer, you had to put down somebody had to sign for it with a name and address, and and you know, if an ABC agent wanted to come inspect, they'd go down to the grocery store and they could see where it was going and all this stuff. And and so for about two weeks, we had nothing but canned beer in, in our fraternity parties for a while. And I was 21 at the time, by the way, mind you. Okay, I was a senior, and um, and uh, we got through that. Eventually, we started having kegs again. But then uh, I started hearing through the grapevine that the administration was going to ban 
was going to ban administratively ban kegs in the row. And the student government president was a pie cap. And so he and I went to uh, President Carrier and sat down with President Carrier and said, you know, hey, President Carrier, your administration's banning kegs in the row. And he said, what? He's like, you got to be kidding me. He's like, I, I, I built Creek Row to get all that stuff out of the town and onto campus. And now we're going to push it back out to campus. Can't have that. And within a week of that meeting with the uh, president carrier, my uh, fraternity president announced at our next meeting that apparently there'd been a change of heart and that, you know, kegs weren't going anywhere. So, um, but keg politics was, uh, was a hot item my senior year. And, um, but it was, it was, it was one way that I was able to help my constituents. Um, and, uh, by virtue of my position. And, um, and so, you know, it, it, you know, I, I, I learned a lot through that and it was, it was, uh, it was fun. I still have met people that talk to me about it today and remind me about it today. So, um, those were some of my, my fun memories. Well, first of all, I had no idea I affected Scott's, uh, social life. So, uh, and I was talking high school students, Scott, if, if, uh, but that, that's a great story. I, I cannot top that. I, mine's going to be very boring after your election story and your keg story. Uh, so uh, way back when I, because I was going to be a teacher, and a lot of you don't remember this guy, but Ralph Sampson was one of the most famous basketball players in the nation, goes on to UVA and uh, is like national player of the year and becomes a celebrity in the NBA. So as you know, as a teacher, you do a practicum where you go to a school and you work with the uh, cooperating teacher, then you do student teaching. Well, Ralph Sampson was in my practicum class, which is pretty cool for a sports guy. He would, uh, he was such a big deal that they couldn't play his games at Harrisonburg High School. You had to come over to Madison to play his games because they were all sellouts. So uh, my claim to fame, knowing Ralph Sampson, not well, but uh, a little bit. Uh, and, and this one's this one is is bland and mundane, but I think it goes back to what we we're saying. The coolest thing at Madison for me, and this has inspired me to be a teacher, which I thought I wanted to be anyway. I had, and I think we've all experienced this. I had several great professors. I had one really great professor, and uh, I took him for I think like four courses in the political science department. And boy, if you don't think you can change someone's even life and outlook and what they want to do through the teaching profession. He did that. And uh, he was inspirational. I had no idea whether he was Republican or Democrat or what he was, but he was just insightful and good. And uh, I always, after that said, I want to be that teacher. And you can ask most students in high school and college why they went into the profession they went into. Not everyone, but a lot of them will say, Mr. Whatever uh, taught me whatever in uh in whatever year so that was and, and jmu gave me that professor and that was pretty special so not as good as a keg story but it, that's my experience well thank you both and um we're getting very close here to the end of our time and i do just want to wrap with one very final question if you can all perhaps offer a brief response we're seeing from many students um Jordan and uh, Parker, who are considering a future in public service. Um, they want to know from, from the both of you, if you have any advice to those who are considering a run at elected office. Uh, after that question, we'll kick it back to Mr. Alger and we'll conclude our time together. Well, I guess it's my turn to start. Uh, the best thing you can do if you're really interested in public office, uh, you can do any major. It is helpful if obviously you're taking some courses, I think, to give you that background. The most important thing, I mean, obviously, if you're big or Republican or Democrat, you know, you can do the college Republican, college Democrat thing. There are two pieces of advice I would give you. The, the, the cool thing to me about politics is you can get involved in a campaign on a House of Delegates level, a state Senate level, uh, a congressional level, a gubernatorial level, that if you're good and you're thoughtful, on policy or you're just a hard worker, it's amazing what you can do in a campaign. It might take you 10, 15 years to work your way up in a law firm or whatever. But my experience actually drove a guy that ran for governor way back when. Uh, and it's interesting, out of that campaign, and we lost, it was 1985, it was white direct. Out of that campaign, Don Lemons, who's the chief justice of the Supreme Court was on that campaign. Frank Atkinson, who was head of McGuire Woods Consulting, and has written three books in Virginia, 
was on that campaign. Uh, Judy uh, Watson Ford basically set up the Watson Center at Christopher Newport was on that campaign. Remember, we lost. Uh, so you can really, to me, uh, you get to meet a lot of good people. You get to meet a lot of people on their way up. And my last piece of advice is that you got to get back into the community that you love or where you want to settle. And uh, it, it, it also cannot all be about politics. You need to get involved in that community, whether you're working on whatever project. I mentioned IDDD waivers with you know, a lot of folks that, you know, in, in the healthcare field, but people that get elected also are ones that people I think are authentic and people go, they, they really care about their community. They care about the system. And it's just not political for them. So it's a little bit of a combination of getting to know some people through campaigns and politics, but also grounding yourself in your community where they just don't think you're an opportunist and this is all about me. And uh, that's the worst. And that's frankly the worst motive you can have. And, and so let me first of all say that I am excited to hear that there are people interested in joining us in Richmond potentially. Uh, Charlie King, your executive vice president, would kill me if I didn't remind everybody that JMU receives the least amount of general fund support per student of any college in the Commonwealth. And if our seven or eight member JMU legislative caucus were bigger, we'd have a, it'd be easier to change that. So we need more of you. We need more Dukes in Richmond to, uh, to uh, uh, help, help look out for the school. But, um, and the other thing, Kirk's being kind of modest, you know, we always heard these rumors when I was in the house of the, the infamous like Kirk Cox uh, constituent service manual or book or whatever it is. It's, apparently Kirk has created some sort of secret weapon manual to help his, uh, his flock uh, pr perpetuate themselves in perpetuity through incredible constituent service details and things. And um, I've never seen it, but I've heard rumors of this book. And uh, so Kirk is sort of seen by his caucus as being sort of a, you know, a, a Jedi, a Jedi over there when it comes to uh, serving districts and and, uh, and serving people and and and, uh, and working on your reelection. So, I'd like to see that book. Maybe one day I'll get to look at it. But, um, <laughs> um, but um, you know, uh, when I when I when I came to JMU, I was mostly focused on the federal scene. My mother worked in Congress for 28 years. When you come out of the D.C. metro area, you get exposed to a lot of the federal government and Richmond and and uh, and local government even are just not really on the radar and uh coming to jmu and 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 seeing what happened to the school I already talked a little bit about the budget but sort of opened my eyes up a little bit more to the state state level of things but my uh senior year president carrier called me up and asked me to come to his office and said that he wanted me to go apply to be a governor's fellow and uh i had, didn't even know what that was and he said, "Will you apply for it? And if you get accepted, I'll make sure the school, you know, gives you a stipend and takes care of you, you know, for the summer, so you don't have to worry about your housing costs or your food." And I applied, and I got accepted. Um, given the way Carrier worked, I'm sure he had something to do with it. Um, but uh, I, I spent the entire summer in Richmond, following around um, Bill Lighty, who ended up being the chief of staff to two different governors, uh, and meeting with everybody in the cabinet, Supreme Court justice, the Attorney General, the LG they took us on field trips, but I learned state government inside and out. And I can't tell you how helpful it was to me to have that base of practical knowledge to work from. It's not something you can learn in a classroom or anywhere else. And, and also my internships in Congress were the same thing. I mean, you learn a lot about how these institutions work when you actually go get and just embed in them for even just a couple months, it makes a huge difference. Um, and by the way, I'm working on, an, on with uh, Mayor LeVar Stoney and endowing a, a, a scholarship to fund the expense, uh, living expenses for two JMU students a year to go to Richmond and be governor's fellows every year. I think it's important that we have two JMU governor's fellows every year in that class. But so get that hands-on knowledge within the government. Um, and don't rule out local government either. Local government does a lot of really important, significant stuff. And you know, a lot of people can set their eyes on Congress and, you know, most people don't run and go straight to Congress or straight to the U.S. Senate. You typically start somewhere else first, whether it's school board or your board of supervisors or city council or something. And you work your way up as you build your political base and you and you get to know more people and people see what you what you can do. So, you know, just keep an open mind if you want to serve about where you're going to serve and go and get some experience so you know how 
you know how that works because it makes a big difference in terms of you being able to articulate a clear set of priorities that make sense and being able to gain a level of trust with people when you talk to them about about what it is you want to accomplish. It, you have to know what you're talking about because most most people, even that don't know government, you know, they have a pretty good, you know, garbage detector and they can tell if you're making things up when you're talking to them and they know if you're pie in the sky and, and promising things that you can't deliver on. So uh, that's some practical stuff. The other, the other thing I would say is, and um, Kirk talked about it a little bit, but you got to get involved in your community. Uh, you have to, I mean, I, I did some things that, you know, don't sound sexy or exciting. I served in the Arlington County Historic Affairs Landmarks Review Board. I was on my homeowners association board. I was on my local chamber of commerce, like scholarship committee. But by doing these things, you build out your peer network, you meet lots of people, um, you, you, you expose yourself to people who see what you're capable of. Uh, you, you build people that will advocate for you and validate you when the time comes when you put yourself out there. And so, it, you know, it's really hard just to parachute in somewhere and just say I'm running and you know, people just don't come running to you and say, oh, thank God you're here. We'll all vote for you. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> and so, you know, you really have to, to embed yourself in a community and work in that community to make a difference before people will trust you to have the kind of responsibility that that we're lucky to, to get to have. It's, it's, it's not that, it's not that simple. And so those are a few of the things that I, and, and working on the campaign, I couldn't agree more. Um, if you don't work on a campaign, if you don't have some campaign experience, there's all these consultants and vendors and stuff that if you're in an important race, they smell that money and they'll come in and they'll sell you on all kinds of stuff that you don't need. And um, it's important that you know how to run a campaign. It's important that you know how to message I mean, I had, you know, poll pollsters trying to tell me what to say. And I was like, I don't need you to tell me what to say. I'm out knocking doors every day. I knock 10,000 doors. I know what people <laughs> react to. I know what works in my district. I don't need that. And unless you, you involve yourself in that environment a round or two before you put it in, put yourself out there, it's really easy to get pushed around by these consultants who tell you, you know, no, your ideas are bad or you don't know what you're doing. You need to do what I say. This works better. Or, you know, put this on your mail piece or whatever. So uh, go out and get that experience. That's what I'd say. Um, so, but I'm excited to hear there's so many people interested in running. I think, you know, the politics of the last five years, 10 years has gotten a lot of people interested in, in stepping up and running for office. And, you know, the, it's just been incredible to see the changes we've seen, um, in the people serving in Richmond, the, the change in, um, you know, we have so many more women that are now serving so many people, uh, from other countries. Now people from diverse backgrounds, we have, you know, the, the first, uh, a uh, transgendered uh, legislator in the country was elected in Virginia. Um, I mean, we, we, we're seeing lots of change and all that's good because that to me means better democracy. Well, I think that's a very high note to end on. And on behalf of the university, I want to thank both our panelists so very much and Ashley as my co-moderator. And I would love to give the floor back to President Alger to take us to close with some final remarks. Thank you, Caitlin, and, and what a, a great and inspiring way to end the discussion with that question. I'd love to see more Dukes and government at all levels, and let's think about that community and civic engagement. Getting involved, being engaged is so important uh, throughout your life. So thank you uh, both Delegate Cox, Senator Suravel for your service, your patriotism, and your willingness to spend time with our students and community tonight. This was really a great example of civil discourse. I mean, how refreshing, right? You, you weren't calling each other names. You weren't yelling. Uh, I think a lot of people actually learned some things tonight. So thank you for, for being those role models uh, for our entire community. And I, I want to thank Caitlin uh, and Ashley for being moderators. Thank you both so much for all you do in our JMU community. And thanks uh, to everybody, our listeners and participants who are with us tonight. You know, we obviously know that our country and our Commonwealth face great challenges. There's no question about that, but I hope that tonight gives you a glimpse of what we can do by thinking together, by working together, that there's a lot that we can accomplish uh, by working together. And so as a university, we know that JMU can and has to be a big tent. That's who we are as a university, welcoming individuals of all backgrounds and perspectives. But I hope that we can strive to, for our, to be that role model for our society and how we can discuss, debate, learn, and work together to address the important challenges of our time. That, to me, is what it means to be a truly great university and community. So thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. 
Uh, please keep an eye out for future episodes of the Madison Vision Series. Have a great evening, everybody, and go Dukes!